Assalam wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Assalam wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Assalam wa alaikum Welcome to another evening of learning with Masjid Asabur Sacramento Assalamu alaikum means peace be unto you. That is the way we like to greet everybody. You know, as usual, we always begin our show by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with the name Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la sharika lahu. I openly bear witness that there is no god but the one God, and I shadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I openly bear witness that Muhammad to whom the Quran is revealed as his slave, servant, and apostle. Dear beloved listeners, viewers, friends, countrymen, and anyone interested, we're going to continue our discussion about Hajj. I should mention one thing because one of the things that really got me was when we went to the Hajj and we landed in Saudi Arabia, you have your passport you have your return ticket. They take them from you at the airport. The next time you see them will be when you are getting on a plane out of the country. And they say they do that to ensure that they don't have guests hanging around that should have left the country. What it told me is be very aware of how you comply with that country's regulations. You know, many times we forget that every sovereign nation has rights to impose its guidance on different activities. So at the Hajj, the Saudi government, for example, prohibits praying at the Prophet's Mosque or at any other places where there are uh, Muslims buried. They also prohibit... Um, you know, sort of the self-flagellation that some Muslims like to practice, and we have to comply with those regulations. Uh, they, they have little religious police that are throughout the crowds to make sure you're dressed properly and behaving properly. So it really is a serious endeavor. Now, when we left our last discussion, we were talking about Arafat and its importance in being a part of the Hajj. Now, we're going to digress for just a moment because during the Hajj, um, if you arrive early, you also take side trips. One of our side trips was to Uhud. Uhud is the battle in which Prophet Muhammad was injured and it appeared as though the Muslims were in danger of being defeated by the Quraysh or the opposition. And what happened was the Muslims rallied around Prophet Muhammad and even the women took up arms to defend Prophet Muhammad and protect his life. And when the Muslim troops solidified around Prophet Muhammad, they then challenged the Quraysh to battle, but the Quraysh left because they figured they had won. And the whole point of Uhud was the battle was won until a group of Muslims ignored the commandments of Prophet Muhammad and left their position. They saw the Muslims winning and wanted to get their share of all of the booty or the prizes of war that were being taken as the army was being defeated. And the position they left allowed the cavalry of the Quraysh to come behind them and catch the Muslim army in a vice. So that they had cavalry on one side, troops on the other, and it almost cost the Muslims the day and the Prophet his life. Now, the reason I bring that up as a digression is again, look at the hill. It's just like the hill we had at Arafat. A stony hill in a dry, hot country. 
Now, I will mention one thing. The Hodge rotates from season to season. We went there in December 2007. The average temperature during the day was about 65 to 75 degrees. And thank Allah, it did not rain. There have been Hodges where it has rained for the entire Hodge. And that I don't even want to think about. Because during the Hodge, remember those tents that we showed you initially that was Mina? Okay, you are in those tents for five days. The tents are not luxurious. And uh, it is definitely a test of your fortitude to be there for five days. Now, this is how the people dress before the pilgrimage. Once you get on the pilgrimage, again, the restrictions are very tight for men. Only the two cloths. For women, it's be conservative, and that's all that you have to worry about. I will point out, one of the things that was most interesting is when we saw the tribes from Africa, the women would always have these bright, beautiful scars. And each group that came together, they all had the same scars. And so they were able to identify each other and keep together as they went through the pilgrimage. Because think about it, you get caught in a crowd of two million people all in white. If you don't have some distinguishing marks, you cannot get through it. Now, as we move forward, you know, one of the things that we also saw was the rituals of Hajj include not just Arafat, we also do something um, that we call the stoning of the Jamarat. I believe that's the next picture coming up. Now, my wife, it's so funny, my wife is not a person who likes crowds. And so she was very nervous about getting in these crowds of Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her that she was able to go through everything and do everything that was critically required and survive. It does require some time. Because, you know, when you go to the Jamarat, they have now built three levels. Ah, that's one of the mosques, Masjid al Kublitan. What that means is this is the masjid where there are two qiblas. Because when Prophet Muhammad received the revelation that we were to stop praying towards Jerusalem and pray towards Mecca, people immediately stopped in the middle of their prayer, turned around and faced the other direction. So they call it Masjid al Kublitain. As we journeyed, one of the things that we had to keep in our mind was our purpose in being on the Hajj was to serve God. The reason that I say that is because it's hot, it's tiring, it's stressful, and some people are just rude. I will even point out to you, we had people who were making the Hajj on their cell phones as they were doing the rituals of Hajj. I couldn't believe it. And today they tell me it's even worse. But, you know, we go there, feast of be Allah. But, as I say, when you see any picture around it, it's fine. Because, you know, right now what you're looking at is the Sa'i Hall. This is in the big masjid at Mecca. And this is from Safa to Marwa, all done indoors on marble. And if you'll notice, it's crowded as heck because there are four levels just like this to do Safa and Marwa. And during the Hajj, each level is just this crowded. And everybody's rushing back and forth between the two Safa and Marwa hills, but it's all done indoors. And I remember the first time that I did it, I got in front of a crowd because, see, some people lock arms and, you know, become almost their own army marching through. 
and you want to make sure you get out of their way because see once they start moving they can't stop you know when you see a crowd like this that's why you say you never pick up anything you drop because if you drop it it may cost you your life you know you you trying to pick it up may cost you your life because if you fall down there's so many people trying to go that nobody can stop themselves from walking on them. It's amazing. You know, each year that's one of the reports that comes out of Hajj is people get trampled to death. Now, the Saudi government is trying to improve that. They're putting in a new transportation system. They build a new system for going through the stoning of the Jamarat. Now let me explain that for just a moment. The Jamarat are three big stones representative of the big devil, the middle devil, and the little devil. On the first day of Hajj, you stone the big devil. For the next three days, you stone the big devil, the little devil, and the middle devil. When you get ready to stone them, you have to have stones that you've picked up in Muzdalifa, which is a way stop between Arafat and uh, Mina. Now these stones you are supposed to be about this big. You see how, how it's about the size of a marble. That's how big the stones are supposed to be. I was in line and personally saw people throwing many boulders at, at, at the Jamarat. Then they get so excited they take off their shoes and throw them at the Jamarat. And then, you know, and if you're in the way, when one of those rocks or those shoes come, you get hit. So it's very important to be careful about not getting between people and the Jamarat. Better to be farther away and not get hit than closer up and get hit. And see, since most of the people are not that tall, Anybody over six feet is subject to get hit. Uh, and it's, 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 it's where we are releasing all of our anger about all of the misfortunes and all of the failures that have come into our lives as a result of the impact of shaitan, of shaitan or the devil. And when people are releasing all of that anger they can get so carried away that they are almost hysterical. And again, because people reach this high state of excitement, you want to be very careful, again, because the crowds are millions of people. Because we're all trying to do the same thing at about the same time. And so when the crowd starts moving, you want to make sure that you're on the outside edge and you're very careful about where you're going. Because in the, in the stoning of the Jamrats, you'll find people's shoes, bags, everything on the floor. And if you trip, Allah have mercy on you. Again, because the crowd can't stop. And inshallah, God willing, you will survive it. But it is a test. So, as we finish up, we just wanted to show you some other scenes that illustrated what goes on at the pilgrimage. Now one of the things that we have no pictures of is the animal sacrifice that is a part of the pilgrimage. After you've been to Arafat, after you come back from Arafat and have done the stoning of the Jamarat, your animals are supposed to be sacrificed and then you may clip your hair and come out of your two white uh, garments. Now, this is about the third day of the Hajj. So you've been in those two white garments for three days. Now, here's the other thing. All perfumes, all deodorants, anything with a smell is prohibited. You may take a shower, but you may not use soap. And so people are relieved to be able to get a good clean shower at that point. But I just want to mention that because now this is during the circling of the Kaaba. If you notice, this isn't even a big crowd. Now I know it looks like a big crowd to us, 
but you see there's white areas in there. See those white areas? That's not a big crowd. When it's a big crowd, you see no part of the surface. All you see is bodies. And when it's Hajj, the bodies are everywhere, even underneath the roof of the surrounding mosque. And they're all going in the same directions. On the second level, same thing. And this picture was taken from the third level, which means each tawaf was one half mile. And we do that seven times. And then we do the sa'i, which is a half mile each time. That's seven times. So just to do the rituals, you have to do seven miles of walking. And you're still five miles from where you're going to sleep. So that's why I tell people, be ready to walk. You will do some walking. Now, it's also important that you recognize that you will find some of the kindest people that you will ever meet, and you will also find some of the cruelest people that you will ever meet. And the test is that you maintain your reason for being there. I remember when we arrived in Mecca at 5 in the morning and got ready to make our first prayer in Mecca. And we got out and they had given us these uh, prayer rugs that were basically pieces of plastic. And so we're going to pray on the pavement, on the street, with these pieces of plastic. And one of the security people saw my wife getting ready to pray on this plastic and he said wait and he went and gave her a prayer rug so that she'd be able to pray on a rug instead of the plastic when i first went into the kaaba to sit down to wait on prayer i sat next to a brother we didn't speak the same language we said alhamdulillah he said haji i said yes and then he handed me his dicker beads. You know, just, just those kinds of kind incidents. But at the same time, you'll find people who are insensitive. We were making the uh, tawaf one night. The call to prayer was made. And a group of teenagers decided they were going to get ahead of the crowd by running while everybody else was trying to pray and knocked over an old man. And you know, I thank Allah, I thank God for the companionship of my wife and the wisdom of my wife. Because one of the things that we also have to take along with piety, with taqwa, faith in God, is also patience, sabur. The ability to endure and succeed. And that's one of the things that you learn when you're on the pilgrimage. Things happen at the pace of the pilgrimage. Here you can see me with two of the guys who are in my tent and in my group. And you know, one of the things that you really become fond of is mishwak. Mishwak is a toothbrush made out of a twig that you chew on until you get bristles. Now, why is it a favorite? Because, you see, when you're in those white garments, you, you, you can't always get to the bathroom when you need to, and your mouth needs some help. And so this allows you to clean up your mouth, your breath, and everything else. It's also, it really does stimulate your gums and give you better teeth. But for us, it was just a way to clean up when it wasn't time to fully clean up yet. But I will tell you, if you'll notice, they're all much younger than me and have different ethnic persuasions than me, but you can develop friendships across all kinds of ethnic and age barriers because you're all there together for one purpose with one intent, which is to visit your Lord's house and to serve God. I am so blessed to still be in contact with people from Hajj, and I'm so blessed that I had the opportunity to go. You know, it's not often that you will see not just the city, but almost an entire country 
that is serving you, the same purpose, the same intent as you, which is, I'm here, oh Lord, I'm here. Because that's all you hear during the Hajj. La bake, Allahumma la bake. And, and that's what we are. We're there for the sake of God. As we say in Arabic, Fi Sabihala. This is a nighttime photo of Mecca and the Grand Mosque as we got ready to leave town to return to the United States. If you'll notice, it's beautifully lit and there are about a million and a half people inside of it. Because since it's the last night, Many people are doing their farewell to wasps, and everybody wants to get a last view of that beautiful facility. It, it's amazing to think that a million people fit in that building. But they have signs to tell you, you can't come in, it's too crowded, which is just amazing. And God was so merciful. You know, it's so easy to get in trouble sometimes because you don't know what you're supposed to do. We advise anyone, ah, here's Jamarat. If you'll notice, you see all of those people and you see stuff in the air, that's people throwing their shoes, sometimes parts of their clothing, at those big rocks which represent the big devil. And then as you go further down, there's the middle devil and the li little devil. But there are three of those big columns that people throw stones at. And then when they get overexcited, they throw their shoes, they throw everything at them. And if you'll notice, it's crowded. Now the big problem there is a lot of people, again, lock arms, and they want to get as close as possible, and they will hurt you. Inadvertently, but they will hurt you. So you have to be very conscious of where you are and how you go around these crowds. The other thing is, this is about, this is at the outside of the mosque. This is when they're finishing the final construction on the, four, on the fifth level of the Sa'i. So that now they have not just four levels, but five levels indoors where you can run between Safa and Mara. Around the Kaaba are shopping centers hotels, and all kinds of developments. And the, the Kaaba is constantly being expanded because of the number of people that want to come to the pilgrimage each year. Most of the world is on quotas right now, which means if you want to come from, let's say, Turkey, or let's say uh, from the Philippines, you may have to wait as long as 20 or 30 years to win the lottery to come. Now North America no longer has, uh, North America has a quota, but we've never even met our quota. So you can sort of decide, oh, I want to go to Hajj, and you can still make it. Whereas people in other countries may have to wait decades before they are able to make the pilgrimage. And they are so, so happy to be there. It's just amazing, they are so happy. We can't say a word that we each understand. We're hugging each other. They're offering us food. They're offering us drink. And it's just the most marvelous experience you'll ever have. God says in his holy book that he will bring us together. Hajj is where he brings us together. I pray that all of you who are Muslim have the chance to experience it. And I pray for all of you who are not Muslim that you see the beauty of in bringing together people of every race, tribe, ethnic group in the world in one universal act of faith and submission. As I tell everybody, I met more people from more stand countries than I knew existed in the world. And the one thing I can say about all of them is they were loving Muslims who came to serve their Lord. That's an experience that only the Hajj will give you, which is why it is almost like the completion of the religion because it shows you the universality of the faith. So as I get ready to close, I want to remind everyone, Juma prayer is held at Masjid Asabur 4920, 
15th Avenue at 1.30 p.m. every Friday. We have Talim or question and answer se sessions every second, third, and fifth Sunday of the month at 11 a.m. We have our Islamic classes for all every second, third, and fifth Sunday at 10 a.m. We also have our website, masjidasabur.org. Please visit us. We are also on Facebook. Please friend us that you can find out about our activities and schedules and even make a contribution. Now, as we close, we want to remind everyone, God is the center of all of our actions. Whether you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, as long as you believe in God, I want to leave you with the greetings of peace. I want to leave you with the greetings that God gave to us to put peace in our hearts between each one of us. Assalamu alaikum. We don't greet you with hello. We don't greet you with hi. We greet you with the greetings of peace that God gave to us. And we ask that you return them in kind, in peace. And we pray that we all, through our submission to God, gain the ability to accept those things that unify us and not just lock on to the things that divide us. Because God wants us all to come together as one family in service to him. Again, my name is Hazem Rashid, Masjid Asabur, Sacramento, 4920 15th Avenue. And I close as I open with the greetings of all the prophets from Abraham to Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalam wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Assalam wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Assalam wa alaikum wa alaikum Assalamu alaikum.